This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. The United States and allied nations in Latin America are ratcheting up pressure on Venezuela in what appears to be a coordinated effort to remove Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro from office. Maduro was sworn in last week to a second six-year term following his victory in last May's election, which was boycotted by the opposition. Days before Maduro was sworn in, opposition figure Juan Guaido became head of the National Assembly, which soon voted to declare Maduro a usurper in an effort to remove him from office. The United States, Brazil, and other nations have welcomed the effort. Vice President Mike Pence tweeted, the U.S. strongly supports the courageous decision by Juan Guaido to declare the country's presidency vacant. On the day of Maduro's inauguration, January 10th, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called Guaido to congratulate him on his election victory to head the National Assembly. Then National Security Advisor John Bolton announced, quote, the United States does not recognize Venezuelan dictator Nicolas Maduro's illegitimate claim to power, unquote. Brazil, now led by the far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, has gone a step further by saying it recognizes Juan Guaido as the rightful president of Venezuela, even though Guaido himself hasn't even claimed that title. A group of Latin American countries known as the Lima Group also recently voted to not recognize the legitimacy of Maduro's presidency. Mexico was the sole dissenter. The U.S.-led effort targeting the oil-rich nation of Venezuela dates back two decades since the late Hugo Chavez became president in 1999. In November, John Bolton accused Venezuela, Cuba and Nicaragua of being part of a troika of tyranny. In September, The New York Times reported the Trump administration conducted secret meetings with rebellious military officers in Venezuela to discuss overthrowing Maduro. In August, Maduro survived an assassination attempt when he was attacked by a small drone. He accused the U.S. and Colombia of being involved in the plot. In 2017, President Donald Trump said he could not rule out a, quote, military option to deal with Venezuela. All of this comes as Venezuela is facing a staggering economic crisis caused in part by falling oil prices and broad U.S. sanctions. According to the IMF, inflation is over 1 million percent in the last year, the highest rate in the world. There are widespread reports of food and medicine shortages. The United Nations estimates 3 million Venezuelans have left Venezuela since 2015, resulting in what the U.N. has described as an unprecedented migration crisis in Latin America. As the political turmoil intensifies, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has reached out to the United Nations to help establish a peace dialogue in Venezuela. Venezuela's foreign minister, Jorge Ariaza, met this week with U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres here in New York. On Thursday, I had a chance to interview Foreign Minister Ariaza, who has served as foreign minister for the past three years. From 2013 to 16, he served as Venezuela's vice president. I began by asking him if he believes Venezuela is being set up for a coup. Of course, it's evident. And you see, this, this man, who, who nobody knows in Venezuela, you ask in the streets who is Juan Guaido, and nobody knows him, but he's been pushed to say that he is the new president by the U.S. He hasn't said that. But, but Pompeo says it, Almagro from the OAS says it, and other presidents says, say that now he's the president. Aman. They are trying to push a political conflict in Venezuela. They are calling the armed forces to make pronunciations against President Maduro. That's what they want, a coup d'etat in Venezuela. They want a war in Venezuela, and it's not going to happen. So let's talk more about what you believe is the role of the United States in coalescing, oppo in coalescing opposition to Maduro. Um, they are the bosses of the, of the opposition. They tell them what to do. Nothing that the opposition does is without the permission or authorization of the State Department, at least, here in the United States. And they, they confess this. They, they say, well, we have to make consultations with the embassy. We have to make consultations with the Department of State. It's, it's, it, it's hap it happens. I mean, they are not free. They are not independent. So, but in spite of all of 
of that. The president is trying to sit again with the opposition, with the democratic opposition, not the extremist opposition that uh, makes demonstra violent demonstrations and, and burns people alive. No? And uh, that is what he's going to insist on the dialogue. But this, what's happening now, John Bolton tweeting and uh, doing communiques and Pompeo and everyone saying that Maduro is not the president, that he's illegitimate, that he's a usurper. Come on. That is a coup d'etat again against Venezuela. Well, explain that term, a usurper. I mean, we're, it looks like, a, you know, a case is being built for an overthrow. And when he, when Guaido, the opposition, the head of the National Assembly, uh, announces that Maduro is a usurper. I mean, they are manipulating the Venezuelan constitution. They say that the elections were almost 10 million Venezuelans voted and more than 6 million voted for Maduro, that this didn't happen. No. The opposition boycotted it. Yes, they boycotted it. Not only the opposition, the Washington and Bogota and Lima and Santiago, these governments, no, neoliberal governments in Latin America. So they said when the elections were conveyed, Three months before the elections, they said they, they're going to be a fraud, and they wouldn't recognize the results. And then they pressed the, the um, uh, potential candidates of the opposition not to register. And when some of them registered, they pressed them to retire, to withdraw, and, and they didn't. And th now they say that because the elections were a fraud, then there's no president in Venezuela. So the, the, the president of the National Assembly has to be the new president, and, and uh, all these governments and the U.S. government. Are, are encouraging this, this uh, thesis. So it's, it's very dangerous. I want to continue on what the U.S. is doing. In November, National Security Advisor John Bolton claimed Venezuela was part of a troika of tyranny. The troika of tyranny in this hemisphere, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, has finally met its match. In Venezuela, the United States is acting against the dictator Maduro, who uses the same oppressive tactics that have been employed in Cuba for decades. He has installed an illegitimate constituent assembly, debased the currency for political gain, and forced his people to sign up for a corrupt food distribution service or face certain starvation. In December, Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro accused U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton of leading a plan to invade Venezuela. Today, I come out once again to denounce the plot set forth by the U.S. to destroy Venezuela's democracy, to assassinate me, and to impose a dictatorship in Venezuela. Mr. John Bolton has been assigned, once again, as the chief of a plot to fill Venezuela with violence and to seek a foreign military intervention, a coup, assassinate President Maduro, and impose what they call a transitory government. Foreign Minister, can you uh, elaborate on this and also this term? troika of um, tyranny, very much reminiscent of George W. Bush's yes, axis, axis of evil. Of evil no? And it reminiscence of the, of the language used in, in the Cold War, Nixon, McCarthy, all, all that uh, dark history, no? And it, it has no sense. We're in the 21st century. You have to respect the sovereign nations. We have the right to uh, build our own model, democratic model. And uh, Yes, uh, the United States um, government, and especially the obsession of Bolton, of John Bolton, against President Maduro, they are behind everything that is happening in Venezuela. Yes, they almost killed, assassinated President Maduro August the 4th with drones. And it. it they, well, let's talk about this. This yes. was the first drone attack, assem attempted assassination on a head of state in history. Yes. Um, August 4th, it was a Saturday, it was in front of the Palace of Justice. Yes. Uh, Maduro was giving a speech. And explain exactly what happened. What happened is that suddenly a drone appeared, you know, and it exploded. Were you there? I wasn't there. But most of the ministers were there, and, and, and the military forces were there, and the, the other uh, branches of power were there. And uh, two, it was two drones. These people were um, trained in Colombia. 
we told, we gave this information to the Colombian government. We gave them the place where they were trained, the, the people who were involved, the names of the people, of the officials of migration that led them um, across to Venezuela with the drones. We gave the U.S. government the information about these people in Miami who met there and also uh, were part of this plot against uh, President Maduro, and nothing happened. Well, before it, in April, uh, at the Latin American American summit in Lima, Peru, Vice President Mike Pence said more must be done to isolate Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. We must all stand with our brothers and sisters suffering in Venezuela. And I can promise you the United States will not rest. We will not relent until democracy is restored in Venezuela and the Venezuelan people reclaim their birthright of libertad. So that's Vice President Mike Pence. In June, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro called U.S. Vice President Mike Pence a viper and vowed to defeat what he called Washington's attempts to force him from power. Every time the poisonous viper of Mike Pence opens his mouth, I feel stronger, clearer of what the road is. The road is ours. It is Venezuelan. It is not the one Mike Pence points out to us, not 20 poisonous snakes, not 20 vipers like Mike Pence. Foreign Minister Adiazo explained. Why, what is Mike Pence's particular interest here? You're looking at Pence. Bolton, Bolton and Pompeo now, Secretary Paris. of State. Well, you know, Pence, you know, he's a religious guy. He's from the extreme right. You know him. And uh, he's obsessed as well with the Venezuelan revolution. And you see, they say that you have to restore democracy in Venezuela. We have a democracy. We have had 25 elections in 20 years. We've had elections for president in 1998, in 2000, 2004, <laughs> 2006, in 2000. 2009, 2012, 2013, 2018. I mean, uh, our people are used to, and not only the democracy, because the Constitution says you have to elect these this, uh, presidents and parliament members and, and mayors and governors. No, because we have our society is, is, is organized in community councils, consejos comunales, and communes, and you take the decisions. Every single day, Venezuelans are exercising democracy. We have democratized the access to education education, which was being privatized before the revolution. We have democratized access to housing, which was also exclusive for the rich before the revolution. We have democratized access to health. We have doctors all over—they were they used to be Cubans, now they're Venezuelans—all over the country. You walk one block, and you have the doctor there. So we are really trying to build a root uh, 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 democracy rooted on the, in, the, in the people, and that is what they don't like, because that is not <laughs> what they would like from, from the countries of Latin America. Um, I want to talk about sanctions and the effect they're having on the Venezuelan economy. Um, you have Henry Kissinger, still an elder statesman, consulted by Democrats and Republicans alike. Let's go back half a century, um, go back decades. He wanted to make the Chilean economy under Allende scream he yes. said. Um, you have the half-century embargo against Cuba. Um, what does economic pressure, economic sabotage, if you will, look like in Venezuela? Um, in November, the Congressional Research Service published a short overview of current U.S. sanctions in Venezuela um, and mentions the Trump administration is considering a new wave of sanctions. But the report also states, quote, although stronger economic sanctions could influence the Venezuelan government's behavior, they also could have negative effects and unintended consequences. Analysts are concerned that stronger sanctions could exacerbate Venezuela's difficult humanitarian situation, which has been marked by shortages of food and medicines, increased poverty and mass migration. Many Venezuelan civil society groups oppose sanctions that could worsen humanitarian conditions. Now, again, this is not uh, the Venezuelan president saying this. This is the U.S. Congressional Research Service. Can you talk about the effect of U.S. sanctions on Venezuela? 
The Venezuelan people are suffering because of these so-called sanctions, which are coercive unilateral measures. This is not approved by the United Nations Security Council. It has no legality. These are decisions taken by one government unilaterally to impose a blockade against Venezuela. So it's difficult for us to import food, to import medicine. We cannot use the dollar as a currency to exchange. We have to switch. Only this switching from you know, dollars to euros is, is more than what we need to invest in, in importing the vaccines for our children or the treatment for HIV in Venezuela for two years. And uh, it's probably the figure that I can give you. It's more than $20,000 million that we have lost because of the, the so-called sanctions in more than a year. So these sanctions are overt. Are there covert sanctions against Venezuela? Of course, because it's not only this that is that is official. It's 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 pressing the the companies not to work with Venezuela. It's threatening to seize a company that we have here in in the United States, Citgo. We cannot repatri repatriate the profit from our company in the United States to invest it in food, in medicine, in Venezuela. And for people to know, Citgo, which is Venezuelan state oil oh, company, yes. um, has been used for many years in the United States to uh, support. Yeah. Poor people yes. um, in their programs for to have oil in the yes. winter. To and we intend to keep on using it for this in the United States, but most of the profit annually should be um, uh, sent to Venezuela, and we cannot do it. It has to be here in the banks in the United States, blocked. We have more than um, 1,600 million uh, dollars or euros blocked in Europe, in this this uh, company intermediary uh, called Euroclear. Why? Because of the sanctions. Um, you mentioned Russia. On Wednesday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov expressed concern over U.S. meddling in Venezuela. Yes. We've heard talk that allows for military involvement in Venezuela, talk that the United States will now recognize as the president of Venezuela, not Nicolas Maduro, but the representative of the parliament. All this is very alarming, and all this shows is that the approach of undermining governments the United States doesn't like stays on as a priority of their activity in Latin America and in other regions. Um, if you can talk about the significance of Lavrov weighing in, also the latest news uh, in December, Russia landing two nuclear-capable blackjack bombers in Venezuela as part of a joint training exercise. It's, you know, Russia has been friends of Venezuela for over 16 years. We believe that the world has to have several poles, several centers, not only the United States. Um, the United States cut all the military cooperation with Venezuela 20 years ago, and we have military cooperation with Russia. And these planes, aircrafts that came this year, they came in 2013 as well, and nothing happened. But this year it was taken like, like it was uh, this. With we were trying to bomb the U.S. and come on, um, that's nonsense. We have the right to have cooperation with Russia, with China, with, with who, 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 whatever country in the world. And what Lavrov said there is exactly what the United States is, do, is doing. And he he knows that they are trying to manipulate the people, the media, the constitution of Venezuela, even to impose a, a man who's not uh, being elected president. We continue with my interview with the Venezuelan foreign minister Jorge Ariaza. You have massive flight from Venezuela. The U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees has called the ongoing Venezuelan migration crisis unprecedented in Latin America. The U.N. estimates about 3 million Venezuelans have left since 2015. Another 2 million are projected to leave this year. About a million of them are living in Colombia. Half a million Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, Chile, Panama, Brazil, all have large numbers. Why, Foreign Minister Ariasa, are so many many people, so many Venezuelans leaving? Well, first, it's not—you uh, know how many Colombians live in Venezuela? Six million Colombians live in Venezuela. Over uh, Peruvians and Ecuadorians, over one million. Um, Spaniards, Italians, Portuguese, Arabs, over two million. So, um, of course, there is migration at the moment, because we are blocked 
because it's difficult to find medicine, to find some some products of food, and uh, the hyperinflation process with an exchange rate, Amy, that is not set by the national um, authorities in Venezuela, by the, the central bank. It's set by web pages in Miami. You know, the exchange rate the day before Maduro's inauguration was uh, one dollar, uh, one thousand bolivars, which is crazy. Well, the day of the inauguration, it, it duplicated. It was two thousand bolivars for one dollar. And that has no economic logic. That is all political. That is warfare. That is using the currency um, uh, against our own people. So um, we are worried, of course, because there are Venezuelans. It's not three million Venezuelans. It's probably one million Venezuelans. And most of the, the people that have, that have uh, uh, gone to Colombia are Colombians that live in Venezuela and that have gone back to their country, and we are willing them for come to come back to Venezuela. That's what we want for the Venezuelans and the Colombians that lived in Venezuela to come back to Venezuela. But the economy, um, inflation over a million percent last yeah, year, well, the uh, highest rate in the world. That's the figure of the IMF. They, that's not the exact. That's not the figure at all. It's probably ten times less than that. It's a very difficult problem. But this inflation is induced from abroad. It is produced by these um, um, web pages and all this warfare, economic warfare against Venezuela. It is not only because we have not taken some measures in Venezuela. Of course, it's not. And it, it's, it makes things very difficult for the Venezuelan mm -hmm. people. So food and medicine shortages, do you feel that your government, the Maduro government, takes some responsibility for of what's course, taking place? we're not perfect. As, as the government here is not perfect at all, and the, the government in Argentina is not perfect, of course we we have responsibilities. But most of the problem, the vast uh, majority of the problems in Venezuela are caused by the blockade, are caused by the warfare, economic warfare against Venezuela. And in spite of all of that, we are in a better situation today than we were in 2016. There is more food, there is more medicine, there is more. Uh, the employment is under six. Uh, unemployment is under 6 percent, and uh, many things. I mean, we have not closed one school, one university, one hospital. We have not expelled uh, the Cuban doctors, because we have to protect our people. We have delivered more than 2,500,000 houses to our people in the last four years. And that is investment that we have made in spite of the sanctions, in spite of the blockade against Venezuela. So let me ask you about Human Rights Watch and the Venezuelan NGO Foro Penal. Recently recently releasing a report accusing Venezuelan intelligence and security forces of detaining and torturing military personnel accused of plotting against the government. The report claims, quote, some detainees were subjected to egregious abuses that amount to torture to force them to provide information about alleged conspiracy. That's psychological warfare against Venezuela. Of course, there are detainees that uh, were in plots last uh, year to overthrow President Maduro, but with no one is torturing them. This happened in the last century in Venezuela. We were used to torture. We were used to students being killed in the streets every week. We were used to repression. That stopped with the Bolivarian Revolution. It doesn't happen anymore. But this on NGOs are paid also by the USAID and the, by the government of the United States, and they say what they have to say, because they are paid. Mm. So, I want to ask you about other leaders in Latin America. On the one hand, you have Brazil's far-right president now, Jair Bolsonaro, and Argentina's president, Mauricio Macri, meeting to discuss joint opposition to the Venezuelan government. Mm -hmm. And then you have the newly elected president of Mexico, AMLO, Andres Manuel López Obrador, who is not joining um, with these other countries who are opposing Venezuela. But first, talk about the Macri-Bolsonaro alliance and what that means joining with the U.S. Yes, as I told you, it's, it, in Latin America, it, it's like a company, you know, a corporation. Um, Trump is, a, is the CEO of a corporation, and these presidents, who are businessmen, are his directors, and they want to be promoted by President Trump. So they have to do—they uh, have to follow the orders. And they have been said that they have to isolate Maduro, that they have to they not recognize Maduro as his government, and they have to do what uh, these, the United States says. So in order to overthrow Maduro. And that's what they're doing. Of course, we are worried about Brazil, because this man 
is far on the right. No? It's fascism um, again. It's it's uh, what we felt that, that that what we believed to have disappeared from the Latin America in history. It's happening again. This man hates women. This man hates um, the black population. This man hates um, the homosexual community. This man hates the Venezuelans. He's a racist. We are worried about Brazil. He hates the poor, but— I mean, And loves the Brazilian, former Brazilian military dictatorship. Yes, he loves the dictatorship. And what does it mean to you that um, AMLO, the president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, the stance he has taken in support of Venezuela? I believe that the president of Mexico is right. We have to respect each other. We have to respect the principles of international law. I mean, if you join the, Uni the United Nations, it's because you respect the internal affairs of the other states. It's because you respect the equality of states. It's because you don't uh, have the right to interfere in, in other nations. That's not what the United States does. They have done wars in, in Iraq. President Trump said that he regretted, we regretted that the United States invaded Iraq because now the situation is worse than it was with Saddam Hussein and the same in Libya. And yet you see the same thing happening. And, of course, a very serious similarity. You have George W. Bush coining the term, or his people writing the term, and him saying it in 2002, axis of evil, hmm. which set up uh, the foundation for the invasion of Iraq. And then you have uh, the U.S. talking about the troika of tyranny and the similarities yeah. between Iraq and Venezuela are three letters, oil. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, many years ago, the original name of the invasion of Iraq was going to be um, uh, Operation um, Iraqi Liberation. Mm -hmm. But they realized the acronym was oil, and they had to change it. That was the United <laughs> States. But what about this similarity, um, this resource? focusing on countries that are, you know, the world's more, most important um, oil providers. I am sure that if, in Venezuela, we only had bananas, none of this intervention would be happening. But we have oil, we have gas, we have um, gold, we have silver, we have bauxite, we have uh, iron, we have water. I mean, Venezuela is a very rich, wealthy um, nation. And that is why we are— they want to rule the country again, as they did until 1998. They want to have control of the Venezuelan resources. And that is why they are so obsessed to overthrow Maduro, because they want to have these resources for the development of capitalism here in the United States. What do you think this coup will look like if it takes place? First of all, it cannot take place, because we have to defend our constitution and we have to defend the peace of the Venezuelan people. Um, uh, and the military forces in, Ve in Venezuela are uh, aligned with the constitution. They support the constitution. And as, as a consequence of that, they support the legitimate president, who is Nicolas Maduro, no doubt about it. So it won't happen. But what they would like uh, to happen is that some militaries uh, say that Maduro is not the president anymore. And and then that they will appoint this young fellow, Guaido, as president, with, with no constitutional support. And then they will have control of PDVSA, of the oil of Venezuela. You said it, the oil. They will have control of the companies on Venezuela, of the resources, the gold and everything. And they believe that is possible. That's not possible. Not, not in Venezuela. Maybe in some other country, but not in Venezuela. I'm looking at a tweet that just came over from Florida Senator Marco Rubio. Um, he says, we must support those members of military in Venezuela who have announced they will defend the Constitution and recognize Guaido as legitimate interim president. That's the president of the National Assembly. Yes. You know that those are supposed to be military people. They live in Peru. They don't live in Venezuela. That's You're part... talking about the picture he yes, tweeted that, out. That, that's a video. Of military men. That's a video that last night came, and, and it, it's supposed to be Venezuelan militaries who live in Peru. I mean, that's part of the show. They're, they are probably paid, maybe by the Peruvian uh, government, I don't know. They are in the Peruvian TV. But that's not happening in Venezuela. That's what Marco Rubio wants, that this were to happen in Venezuela, that the military were to announce that they don't recognize President Maduro. That's not going to happen. And if it were to happen, a, a small group, we are ready for, for any scenario. But that's that they, they, they want a coup d'etat in Venezuela. That's a good proof of what Bolton, Pence and Trump and 
Marco Rubio want for Venezuela. Well, let me ask you about the issue of press freedom in Venezuela. In yes. December, the 75-year-old newspaper El Nacional published its last issue. It was the largest remaining opposition newspaper publishing in Venezuela. The Committee to Protect Journalists reported the closure was due to restrictions that the government imposed on access to newsprint. According to CPJ, over 20 Venezuelan publications have been forced out of print due to government restrictions on newsprint. Natalie Southwick of CPJ said, quote, the disappearance of El Nacional's print edition is the latest casualty of the Venezuelan government's ever-expanding campaign to silence critical reporting and limit the voices of independent media in the country. You know, before um, all this economical trouble and problems we have, we used to subsidize uh, the imports of uh, paper for the newspapers. And now it's the private newspapers that have to import their own newspaper. And it's more expensive. So that's what happened to El Nacional. But El Nacional, you, you can check the social networks, you can check Twitter, you can put in, in, in Google, you can Google kill Maduro, matar Maduro, maldito Maduro. And it's all over all the media in Venezuela. The radio stations, newspapers, t TV um, broadcasting channels they, of the opposition, or probably 70 percent of the media in Venezuela, which is private is against um, the government and encouraging all these uh, situations to happen, because they are owned by the wealthy families, the traditional wealthy families of Venezuela. But, uh, I mean, that, that's part of the show, saying that in Venezuela there's no uh, free press and free But what speech. about the shutting down of this almost no, two dozen papers? That, that's not true. It's, it, El Nacional is not. They bankrupt. They don't have enough money. They don't sell enough newspaper in order to have money to import their own, new, their own paper. For a non-Venezuelan audience, how would you define the Bolivarian um, revolution? I mean, you are the foreign minister under Maduro. You are also the son-in-law of Hugo Chavez. Um, talk about that history. The history of the Bolivarian revolution is a process of uh, independence of uh, giving back to people their rights, of uh, guaranteeing that the people have access to health, to education, to housing, to culture, to their national identity, to their sovereignty. That is the Venezuelan revolution, democratizing our society, really democratizing the, the human rights in Venezuela. That is what we're trying to do, using the wealth of the oil and the other na natural resources to invest it in, in the people, for the people, as Abraham Lincoln said. That's our mean, that's our goal, that's what's happening. But because those resources are not for the U.S., are not for other interests, in the world. They are trying to overthrow President Chavez uh, and then President Maduro, and they will continue. Uh, we, President, President Maduro w would like to have a conversation with President Trump, and it would probably solve some issues, because I am sure that when they, they, if they were to talk and see each other to the eyes, they would see that, 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 that they, can, they can coexist and they can uh, f uh, fulfill some, some agreements between them. But uh, there's no way. I, I haven't been able to, to have a meeting with, uh, not with Pompeo, who, who is the, the my, my like like a minister of foreign affairs no with no one in the in the state department they don't want to have dialogue with the venezuelan authorities what what's that that's that's not civilized final question and this is about the international criminal court um, in september um, argentina canada chile colombia paraguay peru called on the icc to investigate venezuela Human Rights Watch hailed the move, saying, in two crackdowns in 2014 and 2017, Venezuelan security forces committed systematic abuses against critics, including torture. Human Rights Watch research shows um, they detained more than 5,400 people between April and July 2017. Members of the security forces have beaten detainees severely and tortured them with electric shocks, asphyxiation, sexual assault, and other brutal techniques. That's part also of the show. Now, you can compare the human rights record of Venezuela with Argentina or Brazil or any of these countries that are doing manipulating the international institutions and using them to attack Venezuela. We are waiting for Michelle Bachelet, who is the High Commissioner of Human Rights of the United Nations, to visit Venezuela. Michelle she's, Bachelet, she's, the former president yes, of Chile, she's, she's, a torture survivor herself. Yes, she is. And she's been invited by President Maduro, and we're waiting for 
her to come to Venezuela and to see the situation by herself. Um, of course, uh, this is part of the warfare against Venezuela, but as I told you, this is going to be part of the past, Amy. These governments, right-wing governments in Latin America, are going to be over. Some of them this year, some of them next year, and Venezuela is going to be there. At least the How revolution— How do you explain this right-wing wave throughout Latin America, of course, excluding, um, excluding Mexico? Yes, Mexico, Bolivia, Nicaragua, the Caribbean nations, they have uh, popular governments as well. Um, but uh, it's re Uruguay, of, of course, has a, a progressive government as well. But uh, it's it's part of the cycles, no? It's part of the cycles. But I must say that, that the United States was focused on the Middle East uh, after 9-11, and they invested all these funds and money, and suddenly the, the, the progressive governments became majority in Latin America. And when they turned their head, they say, hey, what's happening here. We have to do something. We have to do a coup d'etat in Honduras, because this Celaya is, is trying to do a progressive government. We have to fund the candidates of the right. We have to. So they have had success until now. But the peoples of Latin America are, are, are seeing, are witnessing this, and they will change the conditions. They will change, because the peoples have the right to be in power in Latin America. Jorge Ariaza, Venezuelan foreign minister. He was here in New York to meet with the U.N. Secretary General. He's also the former vice president of Venezuela and the son-in-law of the late president, Hugo Chavez. That does it for our broadcast. Happy birthday to Edith Penty. If you'd like to sign up for our Daily Digest each day, you can text the word Democracy Now!, one word, to 66866. Or go to our website and sign up at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dina Geister, Carla Wills, Tammy Warnoff, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Masood, Charina Nadura, Tay Marie Astudio, and Libby Rainey. Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Naguera, engineer. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.